Hi, everybody. Welcome to Dan and the Tao of Taxonomy, making sense of the best ways to make sense. My name is David Diamond. I direct global marketing for Picture Park, and I'm also the author of Dam Survival Guide, which you can read more about at damsurvivalguide.com. It's available on Amazon. Uh, I have been in the dam industry 14 plus years. Uh, note about that 14, if you see in the previous webinars, it said 12 plus. Um, I just did math errors. I realized the other day that it's actually been more than 14 years. So I've been saying 12 for too long. With me today is David Ricks. He is the owner of controlvocabulary.com and photometadata.org. He is also a Dammy Awards judge for last year, 2011, and I know for 2012 and a member of the IPTC Photo Metadata Working Group, a chief technology, excuse me, chief technical advisor for the Picture License Universal System. Welcome, David. Uh, good morning to you, or, or good afternoon, depending on where people are. Actually, we've got people from all over the planet right now, so they're good, good day to everybody. Good, good day, there we go, good yeah. day. That covers all three. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about your, your background on all this stuff and how you got involved with this. I know you were a photographer by trade at one point and still, and somehow you ended up on this side of everything. Tell us about that. Um, well, I, I've, I've been a photographer, but I've also been a word person. Uh, I, I was one of those people where I was never quite sure if the photo thing was going to work out, so I, I learned and took a lot of communications classes and got a degree more in the journalism side of things, uh, which comes in handy. Uh, but I've always known the importance of words, and when the whole digital thing started arriving on the scene, uh, I got into it very early on, scanning images and putting them on hard drives and very quickly learning, oh my gosh, where the heck did that image go? And mm. about the time that Photoshop 4, not CS4, but 4, came out, uh, they had a thing built into it called File Info. And File Info basically builds upon a underlying schema called the IPTC, which is International Press Telecommunications Council uh, schema. And that allowed for storing about, eh, I think there was about 19 different fields, something like that. Mm -hmm. And one of those was keywords. And the other very important one for finding things was the caption field. And so I answered a lot of questions online, learned about there was only one application at the time that actually came with Photoshop 4 called Kudo Image Publisher, although you never saw the, the name in that, but I digging around found out what it was and learned that if I you know put in captions and keywords into the file info panel that when I imported them into this digital asset management program it would pull in the keywords and the captions and a few other fields mm -hmm. and then you could search on those and so that seemed to be a much better way of dealing with it because I could point that at my entire hard drive and catalog all of those images have a little thumbnail to use this reference and be able to search by criteria of my own device. Uh, but then, of course, the problem became, well, gosh, uh, which words do I want to use? And, you know, if, if you're getting images in from other people and they've got words in them, how do you align everything so that it makes sense and so that you can actually find stuff? Right. And that's what led you to the concept of controlvocabulary.com. Yep. Uh, as a matter of fact, it, it actually, the original site grew out of basically taking a bunch of posts that I had done for online forums and just putting up those articles, uh, and that became the, the beginnings of the site, and then kept going on from there. Actually, based upon some of the work there, uh, it was, I, I didn't know for years later, but a, a fellow who worked at Adobe by the name of Andrew Salop, uh, had actually proposed my name to the IPTC, the people that actually created the schema that's used in the file info, yeah. when they were looking at converting that to work in their XMP format. And so I got involved back in, I think it was 2004, in the the conversion of IPTC, what they call their the information interchange model, which is the, the old style way of, of dealing with the metadata in a digital file, okay. and remapping that to XMP. Okay. So and, and that's become the this IPTC photo metadata working group now. So all right. 
Okay, well then let's let's move on and get started with our agenda today. We'll talk about some definitions and distinctions um, from some terms that people might be confused about. We'll talk about build or buy with regard to taxonomy and controlled vocabularies. And then we'll get into a practical session about putting taxonomy to work. Now for the people in the audience, you've got a control panel up there that uh, GoToWebinar provides there. Uh, you can enter questions into there at any point during the webinar. We will have a question and answer session at the end of the webinar, um, and we will get to as many of those as we can. So go ahead and type those questions in there, and, and we'll get to them. Um, all right, let's get going with some definitions and distinctions. What is a taxonomy, David? What is a controlled vocabulary, and what are the benefits and differences? Why do we care about these things, and why are we so confused by them? Well, I, I think it might actually be make more sense to start with what is a controlled vocabulary, be, or it, I can throw out a little uh, truism, uh, which kind of helps set the the field here, and that is that all taxonomies are forms of controlled vocabularies, but not all controlled vocabularies are taxonomies. Okay. So uh, the easier way to think of this might be. Um, at its simplest root, a controlled vocabulary may be a pick list. A lot of different digital asset management programs will have a pull-down field, or if you're not that familiar with those, you, anytime you've filled out an online ordering form and you've chosen your country or state, there's usually a little arrow that you press and it pulls down and there's a list of things that you choose from, and that's called a pick list. So anytime you have a pick list, some, somebody has agreed upon a set of terms and limited those so that you don't have to, you know, do searches for, I live in Illinois, so, you know, is it I-L, I-L-L, Illinois all spelled out, you know, we're only going to have one of those. Right. Uh, so that, that's the simplest form of a controlled vocabulary. So sometimes people will call these value lists. Um, mm -hmm. If we take that value list of controlled terms and we start... Uh, creating a hierarchy or branches. Uh, we can start at a very broad level, you know, animals, plants, and then narrow those down, you know, under your animals you might have wild animals or pets, other things like that, or you could, you know, start in your kingdom, phylum, class, order, etc., going all the way down like that. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the more complex ones uh, that places may maintain more libraries and kinds of things like that, may be something called a thesaurus, which actually combines lots of different relationships between the terms. So, so you'll have a term and it may tell you that it's the narrower, narrower form of another term, or that it's used for a particular, you know, there's another term that's probably better and you should use that. Mm -hmm. You know, so you've got broader and narrower relationships within a thesaurus. With a with a taxonomy, you may also have synonyms. So there may be another term that other people use. You know, if you happen to be using the word soda, somebody else maybe use pop. For some reason, down in the south, everything's a coke, even if it's not a coke. Uh, <laughs> never quite understood that one, but. Uh, it, it just helps to uh, find things later. And depending upon uh, the digital asset management system that you're working with, uh, at a certain point it kind of blurs the line as to you know what one is because many of them don't really function or, or you know don't match up with exactly the either of these definitions. So uh, mm -hmm. typically a taxonomy is when you get into things that are more organized where you've got broad, narrower, controlled vocabularies, just simply agreeing upon a list of terms. As far as the benefits and differences, the, the key thing is that it just makes things easier to find, because rather than remembering whether or not I include this term or that term, or you know, if you're a, a broad-based stock image library, you might use the phrase pig or pigs rather than you know, the more appropriate swine, or you might use cow instead of cattle. Well, you need to have some agreement as to which one you're going to use, because if you're using both and you don't always include both, then somebody's going to do a search on one or the other, think they've found all of the images, and then only later find out, hey, maybe there's 
another phrase I should have used as well. If you agree upon one term and you always use that and somebody searches for something else, like I, I see you popped up a picture here of a automobile. Right. It's like a, uh, a convertible sports car of some sort. Um, it's a rag top, you know, not a convertible. It's a rag top. Yeah, well, that's kind of that's kind of distorted, but um, <laughs> just because that front end looks so big. But but anyway, so you've got car or auto. Well, you know, if 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 uh, if you had a bunch of images in your digital asset management system, and half of them said car and half of them said auto, right. and somebody did a search on car, they might think that that's all the pictures. Right. And, and that would certainly not help them. But if if you always decided we're always going to use car and somebody typed in auto and they got nothing, then they're going to say, hmm, okay, what's what's another term for auto? Uh, and then, you know, maybe they'll stumble upon car or truck or something like that, do a search on that, find some other things. Uh, okay. That, that's the main thing. The, the, the other thing with that's really important is spelling. Okay, and I, I'm a photographer by nature, and I work with a lot of photographers. And trust me, many of them are not great spellers, <laughs> right. or 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 you, or you could say they're they're very creative spellers, <laughs> right? But uh, by having that already written down somewhere that you're simply picking, you're making sure that the spelling for that is always the same every single time, and and depending upon the system as well. Uh, many of them will have systems built so that if you choose a fairly narrow term, other broader contexts or broader terms that encompass that may be automatically added to the image or, or tied to it in a way so that if you uh, searched for car, it would also be pulling stuff from transportation and other things like that so that somebody else might just search on transportation and within that would be cars. Okay, so let me show you, I'm going to show you another screen here. Tell us what the problem is here and how this is solved using a taxonomy or control vocabulary. Well, the the, uh, the, the fancy word for this is disambiguation. Okay. Because so, what, what we have here on the side by these symbols is is a, they're, they're ambiguous. It, well, or, those three aren't, but the, the term that encompasses all of them, which would be turkey. And so, you know, when you say turkey, well, are we talking about the country turkey? Are we talking about a turkey making gobble-gobble noises out in the wild? Are we talking about a bird that's been plucked and cooked and set on the Thanksgiving table? Right. Makes a difference, mm -hmm. you know. I guess if you want to get into it even further, there's wild turkey, which, you know, that could be the one running around, or it could be bottled. <laughs> so I didn't even think about you, the bottled turkey. <laughs> well, it's a wild turkey. It's a whiskey or a bourbon. Um, so whenever you're just typing in a term like that, uh, a taxonomy or some kind of controlled vocabulary system ideally should have some way to help you disambiguate. You know, it pops up. It says, "Well, you know, some of them are fancy. Even in Google, you go in and you type something like turkey. It might ask you. Some of the systems may say, "Well, you know, are you talking about the country? Or are you talking about the bird? Or are you talking, you know, about the poultry food?" Uh, and so, by choosing, I don't know. Some of the words on there are pretty small, but you know, the different options we have here are uh, animals, livestock, poultry, turkey, animals, wildlife, birds, fowl-like birds, turkey, animals, wildlife, birds, turkey, food, meats, turkey, uh, right. world regions, and the country, turkey, and, and different continents that it's contained within. So depending mm -hmm. on which one is most appropriate, you can make a selection. All right. This, this is where humans come in very handy because, you know, and, and for this one, as you can see here, this may be a little easier to read for people. So we're starting at the top level, food, and underneath food there are meats, and underneath meats there is turkey. And you know, if you wanted, to, if you were somebody who did a lot of photography of food, you might even have you know dark meat and white meat. Right. So if you so let me read this back to you. So without the advantage or the benefit of some sort of structure in the metadata, when I type in turkey, I'm going to get things back that relate to all different forms of turkey. 
Whereas if we have some sort of a structure to it, at least I have the option to disambiguate and say, well, actually, I didn't even think about the country. I'm looking for the thing that is going to be on served on a table. And then I see that, and now the structure is enabling me to really not only dive down to that, but provide some context to the type of turkey that I'm talking about. Exactly. And, and by doing so, then it also broadens things. Uh, an example I sometimes use is if you can imagine a picture of, you know, a young girl with her puppy laying down in the backyard. Right. Well, you know, if you assigned the keywords to that and only the keywords girl, lawn, and puppy, then what happens if somebody is looking for, you know, they're looking for a picture to use on a safe lawn, you know, uh, herbicide, pesticide, something or other like that, you know, if they used um, child, pet, grass. Right. Perfect, perfect match, right? Well, right. not exactly. I mean, conceptually, yes, but they would never find it using those terms because you only had girl, puppy, and lawn. Okay. So, so that, that, that's where, by choosing those three sets, if you had used a taxonomy, it might have included, when you chose girl, it might have said, well, girl is a type of child, and child is a type of human or person, and then you're going to have all of those terms assigned to it and tied to that particular image. Okay. So where do we start, and what things should we consider when evaluating existing taxonomies? In other words, we, we get the point, and we, we say we love it, we want to do it. Where does one even begin to, to incorporate this into a dam? Well, there, there is an examples page on the controlledvocabulary.com website that has, I haven't counted it lately, but there's probably at least 40-some different uh, examples that I point to. Uh, actually, one of them is a, another site actually goes by the name of the Taxonomy Warehouse. And as you might expect, they have an even longer list of things. Some of them are available for sale. Some of them are available for free. Um, there are other, uh, the Library of Congress has their own uh, the source for graphic materials that is available for free that you could take a look at as well. Uh, some of these are structured for particular purposes. And so in large part, I think the first thing that you need to do is to think about the collection of items that you're dealing with and to try to decide, well, what's most appropriate. I mean, if, if you're a pharmaceutical company, your needs are going to be very different than uh, an auto parts manufacturer. Right. Uh, so it's it's hard to say exactly, oh, you need to go here, because there is no, you know, it's not one size fits all. Uh, so those are things to consider. The other thing is the more specialized your needs are, the less likely there's going to be anything out there that you can latch on to and use. Now, you may be able to start with something more generalized and add on to it. Uh, if it's available in a form that you can easily use. Uh, a lot of the, if you're going to start with something that exists, uh, what I would really suggest is you want to involve somebody on your team that has some uh, text wrangling capabilities, um, somebody who's familiar with Excel and spreadsheets and using uh, comma separated value and tab delimited text files because you're going to be slinging words around, reconfiguring them into different formats, uh, possibly even doing some scripting in order to get these. Any of that's going to be probably preferable if you're working with other stuff. If you're starting from scratch, uh, you know, and you've got Excel or some other spreadsheet, uh, even something like Google Docs or, or Google Spreadsheet could even probably handle it, you can actually start uh, putting those terms into some kind of hierarchy where you've got, you know, each of the columns may represent a different level in your uh, hierarchy. So that's one way to work with it. Uh, one thing to that I'd probably say you might even want to start before that, um, there's a technique that a lot of uh, information architects use. Uh, which is the fancy name for the guys who come up with the menus on your websites. Uh, people that deal with that 
they often call themselves information architects. A technique that they've used for years and years and years is you kind of take all the, you'd actually start with like all the pages of your website and start, write each one down on a card, you know, what the content is that's on that page, right. and then you start grouping them into piles. And then, and, and as you're grouping those into piles, you'll say, oh, well, this pile, I could call this pile, uh, I'm trying to think of a, a good example. If I look at my own website, you know, maybe there's a section that all has to do with uh, digital asset management programs or another one on captioning and keywording or something like that. So okay. you group those things together and then give them a title. And then some of those may also fit underneath another level. And so you figure out by grouping and uh, sorting these cards uh, into something that makes a lot of sense to somebody. And then once you get that done, write that down in some form that you can use and then repeat it okay. to somebody else. See if, see if they come up with the same thing. Because if you both agree on it, then that's probably a logical way of putting it together. And this is, I think this is card sorting you're talking about. Right? Card sorting, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, what seems obvious to you may not be to other people. I mean, just as an example, if you've ever gone to a friend's house for dinner and, you know, you're like looking around the kitchen and you're, you know, they say, hey, can you set the table? And you're like going, well, which one's the silverware drawer? And they're like, well, it's that one over there. Isn't it obvious? And you're like going, well, maybe obvious to you, but not to me. <laughs> right. So what about the, uh, the we, we talked to, when we were planning this about the Venn diagrams. How do we, how would we put a Venn di diagram to work to help us sort out a taxonomy? Well, th that helps you understand the intersections of things. Uh, in some cases, you may have some overlap, uh, but some things may fit into multiple categories. If we go back to that turkey thing, I mean, you know, if you look at a term there, that same term may have different aspects or context to it, and those could be represented in a Venn diagram. Mm -hmm. uh, if if anybody here, th there's a, a ni very nice little site uh, called uh, I'm now I'm blanking on it. Uh, it's listed on my website, but it, it's um, they they have little you type in a word and then it will show you all the other associated words with it. Mm -hmm. um, so Visual Thesaurus is what it's called. Okay. And so I think it's just visualthesaurus.com and you can you can run some, uh, they'll let you run a couple of different tests on it to just see how it is. But it, it's great because you'll, you'll think of other associated terms that probably make good sense to include as other keywords to tie to that particular image or asset um, that you might not have thought of. And, and it's kind of a Venn diagram of sorts. Okay. Oh, and we've already answered the card sorting. <laughs> we've already answered the card exactly. Okay, so let's we can we, we're a step ahead there. I guess. We're a step ahead. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so if if we start out like for example, my guess is that the majority of dam systems in the world were developed without this in mind. Unfortunately, so how do you migrate non-controlled metadata into a controlled format? And if you're dealing with multi-language audiences. Should you avoid things like alphabetization that are not going to be relevant across multiple languages, and and how do you deal with the, the right. well? Let's let's start with the the first one there because that's going to be a little easier. Well, um, the the big thing I think part of this will come down to the types of applications you're using, mm -hmm. but typically um, if you're working with a digital asset management system that allows you to uh, pull information that's already in the image files to start with. Um, if they do have any keywords attached to them, then that's what's going to be the non-controlled metadata. So that's in the images themselves. Right. Uh, but it's generally extracted and is also visible in the database itself. Then what you want to do is, is take that information in the database and play with that. Worst comes to worst, you've always got the stuff you could you know, re-pull that from the original asset if, if you really screw it up. Um, but the, the thing you probably want to look at is how do I remap and narrow this down to the terms that 
we want to use or how do I make sure that all of those terms are included in them. Some of this you also need to think big picture. Um, there are some systems that have features built into them that will allow you to perhaps have some kind of a keyword catalog or thesaurus that's tied into the system. Right. And it may allow you to store those values within the database record. Whether or not you're able to push those back into the file itself might be something you want to consider. If, if part of what you're doing is to share these with either another division of your company or another company that's going to help you distribute them or something or other else like that, you need to have some system to share that information with the other uh, folks. Now, you know, in many cases, because most digital asset management systems at this point are pretty good about being able to take an asset, make a thumbnail of it, extract any embedded information in that file and put it into their own database, it's sometimes easier to use the file as a means of transporting that information. Uh, a phrase that's kind of become popular in the last couple of years is uh, the truth is in the file. And by that they mean the information that you need about that resource is buried inside of the file itself. Uh, mm -hmm. If you think of iTunes or now eBooks and things like that, uh, typically the title of the, you know, the image or the, the book or the music file or something like that is going to be in there plus a whole lot more. Um, so you can do the same thing with images or PDFs or other things like that. And that's something to think about down the road. If you're going to do it entirely within the dam system itself and there's no way to get that information easily out of the dam and to somebody else, then you're locked in and that could present a lot of problems later on if you want to go someplace else. So but migrating but wait, wait, let me let me interrupt you for a second. Though, though, but I'm I'm still thinking from the the administrator of of the data mm -hmm. of the digital asset management. I've got a hundred thousand assets in my system, and a, a hierarchical structure that makes no sense to anybody and is completely confusing. And I'm thinking, I'm going to now focus on building a taxonomy that really makes sense. So I'm going to go and I'm going to interview people, and I'm going to do this, you know, whether I'm using a spreadsheet or whatever. But then I'm going to put this into my dam, and is there any any advice or any tricks that you would offer for us to be able to get the 100,000 assets now reorganized into this new structure? This is what well, I, I would say the first thing you want to do is to make sure that the structure that you're thinking of remapping these all to is something that everybody agrees on. Right. Uh, it, assuming that that is already done, then what you're looking at is, okay, we need to look through the database and somehow tag any of the images that need their terms changed. So let's say if, if we, um, let's, let's pick something here, you know, if we've decided that our preferred term is going to be lawn, and then what we're going to do is look through our database and either look through visually and choose all those images that have lawns in them where it's prominent and should be a keyword, tag them and then apply that term to it. Right. Or you can do a search, so you might search on allied kinds of things. Lawn obviously would be one, but grass or pasture or something other else like that that matches the criteria, you need to go through and find each of those, tag it, and then apply the new term to it. And if that new term also com comes with broader contexts, then you can add those as well. Okay. Um, De depending, uh, actually, Eric Scooten, who's one of the Lightroom engineers, had come up with a, a very nice method. He was migrating from his own uncontrolled, you know, taxonomy that he had created within Lightroom to a, a new one uh, based on on my setup, the the one that I make available. And so, what we actually came up with as an idea, or what he did, was he took that and he moved it down a level within their hierarchy so he had his controlled keywords as a sub-level so that anything out floating loose at the top level he could spot very easily and then reassociate that and do a, a batch of them all at one time because you know trying to do a hundred thousand images or whatever in one you know session is not going to happen. <laughs> you're you're going to have to bite it off in 
chunks and, and work on that. And the other thing, depending on how your database is set up, you're probably not going to do that, want to do that on the live version that everybody else is dealing with because words are going to be disappearing uh, from their associations with these images or assets and, and then reappearing in a different form. So you probably want to work on it separate and then migrate that in at one time. Okay, and then what about user education? Would you, uh, would you sort of um, prep the users for the fact that this is going to happen, or would you just sort of tell them about it afterwards? Or what, what do you think the best way? To well, I, I think you need to tell them what's going on. I mean, if nothing else, they they may want to know. Uh, if if your job is a image manager and you're generally pretty good about adding new stuff to it, mm -hmm. if you're spending a lot of time on uh, creating a taxonomy and implementing it, you're probably going to slow down on some of those other tasks and they may wonder why their stuff isn't showing up as fast as it used to. Right. And they need to know that that's coming. But it, in an ideal situation, I mean, what's going to end up happening is, is you're going to now have more times where they search for something, they're either going to find a bunch of images that match it or a bunch of assets that mass, match it, or they're going to find nothing at all. And then the question is, what do they do when they hit nothing at all? Then they need to start thinking, oh, you know, maybe there's a different term I need to use. Um, I, I've tried this before, well, this was probably a decade ago, where, you know, I made the list of terms that we were using for that particular asset system available as a, you know, just a, a page on a, on, a web, on a website that they could see if they weren't finding the terms. And what I found is, Nobody ever went and looked at it. <laughs> but, but, but wouldn't you, couldn't you, what, it, it worked with regard to the migration. If you had, like for example, if the first step of the migration was to add the approved terms to the assets, the second mm -hmm. phase of the migration was to educate your users about what's going on, and then the third phase was to remove the ambiguous terms that were previously used. Wouldn't this kind of be a... Would this? I mean, I don't know. What do you? Th would this be a way of of making this work sort of seamlessly so people don't end up not finding what they're used to? If if your system allows you to do that, mm -hmm. I mean, most of the systems that I use, it, it, by leaving in the the quote unquote ambiguous terms, right. um, you know, how would, you'd have to have some way of flagging those terms to be removed later, right? And and if some of those terms happen to have a crossover, you know, maybe maybe that same term is applicable to some images but not to all, then how do you know which ones to remove and which ones not to remove? Uh, that can be a little problematic. So you, you know, there are potential ways of dealing that, with that if you've got different uh, fields that you might also use for, for those searches and depending upon what you've got available in terms of the finding, right. uh, you might be able to to do something that way. This this assumes that you've got a lot of control and in many many of these systems you don't. And so that can be, I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> okay, no, fair enough. I, and, so what would... My, my, my experience in, in the most part is with a lot of uh, what you would probably call single user or small work group um, applications. Yeah. Some of these really big, you know, uh, Fortune 500 enterprise digital asset management systems like are things that are above and beyond what I'm normally dealing with. Uh, some of them are absolutely excellent. Now, now that we're moving to this uh, software as a service economy, there are a lot of them that are able to, you know, roll out things and make updates much more frequently, which is great. Uh, those that you know are kind of baked in, it's a little little harder sometimes to make rapid change and, and adopt new formats. So Okay. So what about the, the multi language issue? We we we're really That's that's a tough one. I mean yeah. they're they're really uh, what what I would say is the 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 simplest answer to that I mean what this goes back to in a lot of cases where I hear uh, different seminars and things is that people are looking, you know, they want it to be like Google. <laughs> right. You know, and, and yeah, it's a great idea, but uh, most people have no idea what's going on in the background of Google and how many people are working to make that such a seamless uh, 
operation. Uh, most companies do not have the resources to do anything along that line. And so you, you've got to learn to, to work with what you've got. When it comes to multilingual kinds of things, there, there are some thesaurus uh, management uh, books and resources that are available through ISO and uh, the National Information on Standards Organization, uh, NISO. Uh, I'm more familiar with just the, there's one called uh, Z3919, which is just the monolingual. When you start getting into multilingual, that gets a lot more complicated. Uh, one thing that IPTC has been working on that could potentially be an answer to, for this is something called the controlled vocabulary term. And uh, it works similar to, there, there's currently right now, for any system using IPTC core, there are three fields. Um, IPTC subject, genre, and um, I'm blanking on the other one. But, but the IT, IPTC subject code, the way it works, is it assigns a numeric value, and then there's a lookup table that's tied to uh, uh, about seven or eight different languages. So I, I think you know they've got German and French and Swedish and Spanish and English and stuff like that. And so rather than assigning a uh, term in English, what you end up storing in the database is a number, and then you've got to have a lookup table that says, you know, if you do a search on architecture, then it says, oh, architecture, that's 01156, or what, you know, whatever the number is, and then it goes off and searches for that number, returns those assets or images for you to look at. Okay. Now, that that's generally at least from what I have seen, that seems to be one of the better ways to deal with multilingual kinds of things. The way that a lot of other sites deal with it right now currently is they'll have one specific term, say in English, and then in the interface that the user is using, there will be a way to tie in something called a synonym, synonym lookup table. Uh, and, and this can be used for different languages, but it can also be used for dealing with different concepts. So let's start with a simpler one. If we're dealing with English and you have a bunch of images in your database and a new buzzword is ecotourism, well, what is that, you know, that has to do with images that may deal with tourism, but there's also some kind of green component or, you know, ecological angle to it. So you could go through and, and rig your system to say if somebody types in ecotourism, do a search on tourism and then do a search on ecological or some other term that you have green or something like that that you're using now and put those together and deliver that to them. And you could do the same thing with languages. If somebody types in the word dog and, or, or let's say they're in Spanish, if they type in perro, you know, then the system is smart enough to say, okay, this is a Spanish word, it means dog, do a search for dog and return that to them. Mm -hmm. Now, very few systems are going to have that capability. That's that's the problem. I mean, your your off the shelf software is probably not going to have anything like that. So maybe with regard to a, uh, if, if you've got that situation in your dam, the trick is to make sure that the interface enables the user to choose the language that he or she is operating in to, to do that disambiguation for you so that you don't get that. The localization? Yeah, I mean, because ideally, like if you're embedding information into the file itself, the the keyword field, while it's, you know, entire from a technical standpoint, it doesn't really care whether what's in it is English, French, or Spanish. Right. Um, putting and you know all of those terms in for every single keyword term that you have from different languages is going to really bloat that file and depending on the indexing may or may not make a whole lot of sense okay all right let's get let's <clears throat> move on to some best practices for editing in use taxonomies and and, and the, the issue here is that when you've got this taxonomy you've got a bit of a standardization going and then 6 months into it you realize oh we didn't do that right we should change that so how do you, what, do you have any any tips for a clean way to basically change a standard? And do you ever uh, do a review and reduce where, for example, over time you think, okay, you know what, we've we've given 
five different synonyms to this particular word, and we find through statistics that users are only ever using two, so we're going to kill off those other three. Is, are these bad practices, or what would you say? You know, what I would say is if, if it's, in large part, I, I think a lot of this comes down to understanding the system. I mean, if it's something that is bogging down the system and requiring more, you know, computing power, it might be something to consider. Mm -hmm. In most cases, though, you know, my sense that I've gotten is, is that in very few instances is that going to have a huge impact on a, a digital asset management system. There, there are a lot of them um, that I have used in the past that do have limits right. in terms of either the size, the maximum size of the catalog, or the maximum size, or the, the maximum number of assets that it can catalog. And in large part, what I have found is that the size of the thumbnail and the quality of the thumbnail makes a much more dramatic impact on the number that you can store. I mean, most of them have, you know, 200,000, 400,000, you know, assets maximum that it can handle. Rarely ever in most systems do you ever get close to that. Usually you'll start running into problems way before that because most people start off by trying to make thumbnails that are either really high quality or really big. And, and that will eat into your maximum catalog size much quicker than, than anything else. So, you know, whether or not there are, you know, 10 keywords or 30 keywords for an image uh, multiplied by, you know, 50,000 or 100,000 images mm -hmm. is a drop in the bucket compared to making your thumbnails, you know, uh, if you're starting out with them being, you know, uh, 250. man, things will shrink quite a bit. Um, you know, a lot of it's going to have to do with the system that you're using. As far as editing in use taxonomies, I mean, if you're migrating or something like that, uh, that's something that you probably want to keep a close eye on. I would say in most cases you're better off, you know, adding is usually not a big problem. Changing can be a problem because you're going to have certain users that are used to doing a search for a particular term and, you know, you change it and then they go back and now they're not finding anything. And okay. that's probably going to, you know, there's going to be a bit of freak out that occurs there. So I, I don't know if I would necessarily encourage that. Um, it, it's it's probably the, the bigger thing that I see is is people that are, developing taxonomies for a particular system and they spend an awful lot of time on, you know, making it absolutely perfect and it covers everything that they're dealing with right then, but they're not perhaps thinking broad enough or, you know, it, it's, it's not hard to go into further detail, like say if you have a taxonomy that's got animals, pets, dogs, to start adding all sorts of breeds of dogs to that. So you're, you're just flushing out the bones that are already there. But if you don't even have an animal section, mm -hmm. then on the fly, all of a sudden your first dog image shows up and you're like going, oh, where do we put this? Right. And that's going to probably create a lot more problems because you haven't thought big picture about where everything is going to belong. Okay. So what – if I don't see the taxonomy menu in my dam. Is all of this a moot point for me? Is there a way to deal with this stuff if your dam doesn't add? Well, yeah, I, I would say most of them. It, most of them that I have used at this point never. You, you're never going to see a taxonomy thing. You you might see uh, the most common thing I have seen in the last five years, uh, and and I've worked with a lot of the at least the single user developers. Um, is something typically tied to keywords, uh, and it may be a separate panel that opens up, or uh, it might be kind of a something that appears on the right or left-hand side of your main viewing platform. Uh, some of them will have separate standalone little palettes where you can assemble these things, or uh, some of them, like the Apple stuff, they have they call HUDs, heads-up displays, where you can right. kind of drag them around. Uh, many of those will have different ways of looking at it. Um, those are 
those people that work on Macs may be familiar with what they call the column browser, and some of them use that same kind of concept for storing the information. So, you know, you've mm -hmm. got your, your column over on the left-hand side, and you've got, uh, you know, a limited selection of things. You choose one of those, and then all of a sudden another panel opens next to it with a whole bunch of choices underneath that. You choose one of those, and it, it just keeps going down. And then based upon that, you choose something at one of those narrower levels, and it will associate not only that term, but everything else along the hierarchy, and in some cases, maybe other synonym terms that are tied to some of those. Um, so, well, first you... of all, look for something. First of all, look for something like that. But mm -hmm. the, the bigger question is, if you're working with, say, a system and it has nothing like that, uh, there are ways to do that with some kind of. Uh, you know, a workaround or a kludge is something, there are a couple, actually a couple of little videos that I've done that are up on the controlled vocabulary site in the, uh, I think it's in the support section. Uh, if you look for video tutorials, uh, they're called, usually they, they have the word keyword generator in it. So you can use a, an application that may have the means of creating a set of keywords to go with an image and you can have both applications open. You can use the keyword generator in one and then copy and paste that into your other enterprise dam or something like that. Now, before you go and jump into doing this, you need to do some testing because not all systems will allow you to copy a long string of terms that are separated by commas. Some of them may have you know, they may say, well, yeah, you can do that, but they have to be semicolons, not commas. <laughs> or they need to be hard carriage returns or something like that. Some, like, you know, if you were going into Photoshop itself, uh, if you open up the file info menu and go to the keywords, you can cop copy and paste in uh, a set of terms separated by a comma, by a semicolon, or a hard carriage return. Whereas, uh, like, Media Pro, they have to be only commas. It won't recognize the other ones. Okay. So, you know, de depending on what you're doing, you may be able to do that. I, I, I've used a couple of different applications over the years, such as Image Info Toolkit and more recently Photo Mechanic, uh, because I, I really like the way the Photo Mechanic keyword catalog works. It's, it's a structured keyword catalog. You can type things in. It's got that disambiguation, uh, and you can choose whether or not you want the synonyms or all the terms along the branch and things like that. You can assemble all those keywords and then copy and paste into... Uh, another application. Okay. So what happens now? What should the, the people that are, are listening to us now, what should they do next to get started? Where can they go for more info and for more help? And I will just go ahead and put that up there. Well, that, that's, that would be a, a good place to start. That, like I mentioned, there are some resources there. There's a, a section on uh, usually one of the bigger things once people figure out a system is then then they just get into the issue of, well, who's going to do the keywording? How do I teach somebody to do the keywording and the captioning? Because people have different philosophies on this. There's a whole section on uh, called metalogging that deals with captioning and keywording. There are some video tutorials. Uh, the other website that I maintain called photometadata.org also has some tutorials on there, including some videos showing you how to use some very popular uh, applications such as Adobe Bridge and Photoshop and Expression Media and Photo Mechanic and some things like that mm -hmm. uh, for putting metadata into images. Uh, those are good places to start. Uh, there's also a forum that um, I moderate as well. We've got about, I think, about 1,300 members, some, something like that now, uh, with people that have experience with all kinds of digital asset management systems. So mm -hmm. chance, if you run into a problem and, and the application that you're using doesn't have a forum or uh, you know, the support that you're getting is not what, sh what you'd like, uh, there may be somebody else on, that, on the controlled vocabulary forum that's got some ideas. OK. <clears throat> all right, then uh, let's move into our Q&A session. Before we get there, just a little for those that are wondering about Picture Park. Uh, the sponsors of this webinar uh, offer DAM systems for the cloud, on-site, and hybrids. So you can choose what's best for you. And if uh, regulations or finances or other things force you to change your mind later, you can do both. Or you can do that. And you can also leverage uh, both in the hybrid systems. 
Picture Park was founded in Switzerland in 2000, offices in Aral, Switzerland, in San Francisco, Vienna, India, with a partner network that reaches everywhere. And this is digital asset management innovation, modern design that works with the applications you use. These are some of the applications that already have uh, integrations with um, Picture Park. Okay, so we're going to open the, uh, uh, the floor up for questions now. I'm going to go over here to this little section of the... Uh, uh, control panel here and all the black will be flashing all over your screens. I apologize for that. Um, let's see here. We've got uh, some, qu I, I, I gotta zoom this out a little bit. I'm, I apologize. I know that's gonna look ugly on your screen. Um, first question from Steve. My dam doesn't, doesn't handle, oh, this is a good one. My dam doesn't handle round tripping well because of the way categories work. Any suggestions for making this work? Um, well, the round round tripping is is a uh, a phrase. Usually, the the big issue with that is you you've often got different methods of storing the information into the images themselves. So, if you're moving between an enterprise dam that may not be as up to date, or it may not know or understand XMP and only understands this older format called IPTC information interchange model. What can happen there is the applications you're using to embed the information into, when it gets sucked into the dam, it's going to grab a hold of this older format. Now, one of the bigger problems that you often see there is truncating of fields. So if you, each of the fields in the IIM has a specified character length, and so if you exceed that, it'll just get chopped off. Uh, the keywords field is actually one of the better ones because it, it's a, 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 rather than a field with a specific length, it only has a specification on the maximum length of the keyword, which I believe is something like 64 characters, which is quite a lot. Um, a single keyword that's 64 characters, I, I, I have run into very few of those. Um, so and there's no limit on the number of keywords. So that's usually not an issue there, but as far as like the captions and the credit fields and other things like that, you can find things disappearing. Depending upon the uh, enterprise system, if it has the ability to write back to the file, this is probably the problem that he's talking about when you're talking about round tripping because you, you'll add information to that, push it back to the original file, but it's only being stored in the older way of storing the information and some systems don't work really well uh, like for instance if you're using uh, a system that is using XMP most of those are set up uh, to say oh well look there's IIM information and there's XMP information and well XMP is newer stuff so I'm going to use that and it just ignores the other. Uh, the metadata working group which is I think metadata working group dot com uh, is an association of a bunch of big players in this and one of the things that they've instituted is there's a, a something that can go into the information in the header of the file that tells newer systems that okay yeah there's IPTC IIM and there's XMP in this image but actually the IIM has been updated more recently so use it okay. and and if both of them work together nicely then that could help solve the issue. If it doesn't, another way of getting around it is there are other tools out there where you can set them up to read one type of information over the other. Uh, the one I use the most is Photo Mechanic. You can go into the preferences and, and say, okay, from now on, look at the IIM information first if it's there. If not, then go to this, go to the XMP and use that, and then that way you can open it up and then rewrite uh, the information into both of the fields and synchronize it. Okay, so Kathleen is asking, is there any software that assists in card sorting exercises and heuristic analysis? You know, actually there is, I don't have that at my fingertips, there, there is a, a good forum called, uh, it's, a, it's a Yahoo group forum, Yahoo groups forum called TaxoCop, which is short for Taxonomy Community of Practice. Okay. Uh, if you search on that, you should be able to find it. I, I recall a conversation not that long ago where uh, it's basically what it is, is it's a set of templates. I'm trying to remember the woman's name who put them together. I think it was Donna somebody. Uh, 
uh, I can look that up and we can post that somewhere, but, but it's a, a kind of like a template spreadsheet kind of thing that will work with Excel where you can put the information into it and allow people to kind of, you know, move the, the cells around into ways to make it easier to, to help you, you know, work up something that, that works like card sorting. I, I mean, personally, when I oftentimes work with groups, I literally work with 3 by 5 index cards. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, but Tracy has just popped up. The name of the software that you were talking about is Optimal Sort. Does that sound familiar? Mm, uh, th that might be another option. I, uh, mm -hmm. I have not looked at that one. The, mm -hmm. the one that I was talking about is there's uh, somebody... She, she works as either a taxonomist or an indexer uh, and, and had put up on her website there were just like some files that you could download and use in Excel. Okay. But that, that optimal sort may be something to check out. Okay. So N Natalia is asking a similar question now, but just generically for taxonomies. What software would you recommend for creating and editing taxonomies? Um, you, you, for some reason, I don't know what was happening, but you, you were making weird noises there. I only oh, caught okay. part of that question. So could you repeat that? Yeah, it, it comes from Natalia, and she's asking, what software would you recommend for creating and editing taxonomy? Um, well, I mean, the, the thing I use most is, is either a, a good, just a plain text editor, if, if you're used to working with text only, or a spreadsheet, whether it's a Google Docs, or Google Spreadsheets, or Excel, or Lotus123, any of those will work. Uh, most of the applications that I work with now, what they allow you to import is, is a very simple text file. It's usually a, either a tab delimited or comma separated value text file. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to need to work with something that can save out that. There, there are uh, very expensive thesaurus systems that have the whole range of broader, broader and narrower context and use fors and preferred terms and things like that. But most of those that I have looked at, I mean, you're looking at anywhere from at the low end, maybe five hundred or a thousand dollars, all the way up to you know five k or more. Okay. And they don't really allow you to export stuff out. Uh, two of the newer things, perhaps, to look at. Uh, I have not had a whole lot of time to dig into them, but there's a thing called SCOS. SKOS, which is uh, short for, I think it's Simple Knowledge Organization System, uh, or Schema, okay. and they they just released a spec, I think it was like within the last year, year and a half, uh, for storing information, and there's another one called OWL, and I, I do not recall what the acronym for that is, but it's O-W-L, um, and they're I think there's some way of moving some of those back and forth. The underlying structure, though, I'm not very familiar with. But but if you're working with image assets, uh, oftentimes what you're going to end up dumping stuff out in in order to import it into the application is a fairly simple tab delimited text file. Okay. Now we're we're running out of time. I just I want to throw a few things out really fast. Uh, Kristen is asking about the metadata forum address. I'm guessing that's at the controlledvocabulary.com site. The the forum, yeah, if you, if you go, I think it's under the support section. Uh, I don't have it here at my fingertips, but if you... Don't worry about it. If they can find it from yeah. controlvocabulary.com, that'll work. If you, if you just look across the main menu, it's in one of those. Okay, and then and, and then a lot of other people are throwing out um, software names for uh, for editing taxonomies and all that. We will get those posted rather than do them all. Yeah, I, I'd love to take a look at them. It's uh, when It's been a while since I've dug into them, and I'm hoping that there are some more and better things that are out there. Okay, and then we'll we'll take the, we've got there's so many questions and everybody is like firing them off now we're running out of time we, we will get all these questions answered and get them up on a page so you can uh, after David answers them we'll, so that everybody can read those we'll let the last question come from Ian uh, designing a taxonomy for a large organization is complex who should comprise the team to develop such a controlled vocabulary and who should make up the team to maintain it. Well, the, the thing that I would say is the most important thing is to get involvement from all the key players because if, if people do not feel like they were part of creating the solution, they could sabotage it uh, or, or just not be very into it. Uh, 
typically whoever is going to be heading that up, you want to have somebody that's got some really good people skills. Uh, you know, the technology on the back end can be handled by probably a lot more people than you know, it, it takes a good salesperson to be able to work with you know a wide variety of people you know assure them that their concerns are going to be met and help them understand how this is going to be a good thing down the road uh, and and that is not an easy thing to do right uh, I, I know some organizations find it easier to bring somebody in from the outside to do that because then you've got the, the whole outside expert syndrome going right. uh, sometimes that can you know not work so well with some systems because there may be some some turf issues um, but that, that's a very good question and it, there is no one-size-fits-all answer okay well we will put this uh, um, uh, all this information out on the web and uh, people will be able to discuss further um, David thank you very much for uh, agreeing to do this webinar with us and for pro providing such great information I do encourage everybody to visit control vocabulary Dot com. I know personally I've learned so much more about this uh, subject uh, while in doing the pre-interviews uh, with David on this and, and it's really it's fascinating stuff and it really really will make a dam system far more user-friendly and functional uh, so I recommend that people get involved with this and thanks to everybody who's uh, attended and thanks to everybody who's rapid firing the thanks and and uh, and and best wishes on the webinar uh, to us at the last few moments. We really appreciate everybody attending these things. And um, we'll send a follow-up link for the recording, and we'll let everybody know what uh, future webinars are coming. Uh, and, and there was a, a, some Twitter winner that we need to figure out as well, don't we? Yeah, we will we will, uh, we'll do that, and we will announce that on Twitter for those of you that have entered that, uh, that contest to win the um, uh, Control Vocabulary subscription for a year from, from David. So we will announce that on uh, on October third. I think the date. Well, well, thanks for thanks for the opportunity. And uh, it sounds like from some of those questions and people tossing out the software that uh, there may be some things that I can learn as well, which would be great. Yep, this that's what it's all about. We're all learning here, and I really appreciate everybody's participation in this. Thanks very much, and we will see everybody at the next webinar.